Hey guys, so in the last lesson we wrapped up the CRUD operations for the categories page and I asked you to build the same CRUD operations for the transactions page as an exercise. If you did that, great job. If not, it's okay. We're going to go through the code that I wrote to implement the same thing in transactions page. Just a quick note here, it's totally fine if your solution is different from mine. As I always say, there are many different ways of doing things and a lot of things come down to preference. So don't worry about it if your code differs from mine. All right, so as you can see, I have the transactions page open here. It's loading the transactions correctly. Uh, the sorting works. The search works. We are able to add new transactions. We are able to edit and delete transactions and so on. Now let's open the code editor and review the code changes and go through them. So first, of course, we have the new routes for the transactions and the new controller. So within the web.php routes file, we have this transactions section here. We have slash transactions route, and then the routes are pretty much the same as the categories routes, except that these routes point to transaction controller. A quick note here, I also renamed the categories controller to singular category controller before it was categories controller and I want to stay consistent so I renamed it to category controller. Now let's review the transaction controller and all of its methods. So first we'll review the index method here, which basically renders the transactions index twig template. And I'm also passing the list of category names as a parameter. If we inspect the get category names on the category service, we see that it just selects a category ID and name and returns it as an array. Then if we open the transactions index twig template, we see that it's pretty similar to the category uh, index template and I have a typo here this should be transactions and not categories that's what happens when you copy and paste the code then we have the button to add the new transaction we have two models one to create the transaction and the other to edit the transaction and then we have the table for the transactions as you might have noticed I'm using the same model template to create and edit transactions and I'm passing the couple of parameters to it like the title ID and whether or not we are editing the transaction to sort of give it the dynamic feel. You could use JavaScript if you wanted to and only have a single model template here and then replace the data using JavaScript, but I decided to keep it simple. Next, if we open the transaction model template here, we see that it's pretty much the same template as the new category uh, model. The difference is that now we have some of the things dynamic like the ID, the title, we have different fields here like the description, date, amount. For the date I'm using date time local uh, input element type and for the amount I'm using the number type. And then we have this uh, drop down for the categories where you can select the category for the transaction. This is where we loop through the categories that we get from the transaction controller from right here. Now, a better solution probably would be to use JavaScript to dynamically load the categories via Ajax call. If you did that in your own solution, that's great. If not, that's also fine uh, as long as you don't have thousands of categories. If you do have a lot of categories, then I would would suggest to use Ajax call to load them dynamically. All right, let's close this out and instead let's open the transactions JavaScript file because that's where we're handling the data table and all the JavaScript related stuff for the transactions page. As you might notice, it's pretty similar to the categories JavaScript file. We are instantiating the data table here. We have two models, new transaction model and the edit transaction model. We're making an Ajax call to the transactions load endpoint and we're defining the columns in here. For the amount column, we are using using ES internationalization API to handle the formatting of currency and I'm going to leave the link to the documentation in the description if you want to read more about it. But basically it's JavaScript. Everything else pretty much is the same. We have the sorting disabled for the category and we'll get to this uh, towards the end of the lesson. So stick around to find out how we can sort by the related column at the end. If we scroll down here, we have the click events on the edit and delete transaction buttons. Uh, we make get request to fetch the transaction info and open the edit transaction model. Or if we clicked on the delete button, then we're making the delete request to the transaction transaction ID endpoint after user confirms 
the deletion. If we keep scrolling, we have another click event where we are creating the transaction. So it's a post request to the transactions endpoint. Now in here to get the data that we pass to the request from the model, we are using a function called get transaction form data. And we also use the same function uh, when editing the transaction. So if we inspect this get transactions form data function, we see that it just extracts the field name and value and stores them as a key value pair and then returns that as a data. So we're basically looping over all the input elements from the model and all the select elements in the model and then saving its name as the key and its value as the value and are returning that. And then we're passing this data as the body to the request. And that's pretty much it for the transactions JavaScript file. One other thing that uh, we did here is that we added a new entry to the webpack config file. So if we open the webpack config file here, we have a new entry for the transactions JavaScript file. All right, so let's close this out and let's continue with the transaction controller here. So we'll scroll down. We have the store method, which is responsible to create a new transaction. And here we have a new request validator called transaction request validator, which basically validates the transaction data that is passed to the request. So if we inspect this, we see some of the basic validation rules here. And you might notice one somewhat custom rule here where we are validating the category to make sure that the category ID that is given to the request actually exists in the database. So that's what this rule is doing here. We are getting the category by the ID from the category service. And if it doesn't exist, we return false. But if it exists, we return true. And we're also overriding the category entry in the data variable to be the category entity. So it's no longer going to be integer. Instead, it's going to be an entity. That way, we don't have to call the get by ID in the controller anymore. We can just access the category entity through the data variable because remember we return this data variable at the end so that data is basically whatever data we pass to this validate and we're just making a slight modification here to set it to a category entity instead of being just an integer so if we go back to the controller here this data variable now contains category entity and the category that we pass in this DTO here which is a transaction data DTO this is a category entity and not an integer if we inspect this DTO we see that we have the description the amount the date and the category entity if we didn't do this right here uh, this part then we would have to call the get by id again within the controller to pass the category entity to the dto then we're passing this dto as well as the user to the create method on the transaction service and this create method is pretty much same as the category service create method we're just creating a new transaction entity we set the user we call the update and we're just setting some of the values in here let's go back Back to the controller and continue with the methods we have a delete method which deletes the transaction by the id the delete method again is pretty identical to the categories uh, delete method then we have the get method which fetches the information about the transaction we get the transaction by the id first we format the data that we need like id description amount date and category and we return it as json then we have the update method here which updates the transaction we are again using the same transaction request validator class here to validate the data i decided not to create two separate uh, validator classes in this case because they were pretty identical and i didn't really need to validate the id part because we have that part handled right here so it was better in my opinion to just stick with one validator class if you want to have some custom validation rules for update method then you're free to create a separate validator class but for this case it was fine to use the same validator class again we're creating the same dto object we're passing it to the update method on the transaction service which updates the transaction then we have the load method which is used by the data table to load the transactions data 
we are using the same get data table query parameters that we built in the last lesson for the request service and we're passing those params to the get paginated transactions method if we inspect that this is also pretty much the same as the category service get paginated categories method then we transform the data to the format that the data table understands and we send the response all right so there are a couple of more changes that i made behind the scenes one is that i added has timestamps trait to the transaction entity so if i go to the entities here and i open transaction entity I added has lifecycle callbacks attribute and has timestamps trait. I also moved the getter and setter of the created at and updated at methods within the trait and removed it from the other entities that had those methods. Also, one other change that I made is that I realized that the errors were not being logged properly when using Docker. So I made an adjustment to the local PHP configuration file, which is local.ini, to send the logs to storage slash logs slash PHP underscore errors dot log. This way, if there are any PHP errors, it's easier to debug since logs will be within the storage directory. So if we open the storage directory here, the logs directory, all the PHP logs will go within the PHP underscore errors dot log file. If you use Docker, just rebuild the containers. If you use something else like XAMPP or Laragon, adjust your PHP INI file to save the logs to the storage uh, directory. Or if you're okay with wherever the logs are stored on your development environment, then leave it the way it is. One final thing that I made changes on is within the ajax.js file. I decided to only show one validation error per field at a time. That way it looks better than having a bunch of validation errors show on top of each other. I also removed the input part from this uh, query selector here. This used to be input name and I removed this input because now we have the select types as well. So I decided to just remove that and select any field with the name attribute. And that's about it. I know it's a lot. Let me know if you did the exercise and how far you got, what challenges you faced and so on down in the comments. It's okay if you got stuck or were not able to complete it. You can use this lesson to sort of get ideas and then try again. I know that we have some code that can be refactored to make it uh, better like transformer callbacks for example but i want to avoid overcomplicating things so that's why i'm uh, keeping things as simple as i can sometimes it's better to have a little bit of duplication instead of too much abstraction all right so before we wrap this up i want to make one small improvement as i mentioned in the beginning we have the sorting disabled on the category column here because i wanted to implement the sorting on a related column together in the video instead of doing it behind the scenes if we go to the page here and refresh the page we see that we cannot sort by category so what we want to do is that we want to sort by the category name which is a related table to the transactions right it's a relationship uh, transaction doesn't contain the category name it only contains the category id so we have to figure out how we can sort by the category name first we need to add the category in the allow list then if we keep this order by the way it is it's just going to sort by t dot category and that's simply just not going to work we don't want to sort by category id we want to sort by the category name now to sort on the properties of the related entity or the related table, we want to join that table or that entity to this query. So we could call left join in here and we can join T that category and alias it to C. And this is going to handle all the joining behind the scenes. It's going to do category.id equals uh, transaction.category underscore ID. Then within the order by section here, instead of ordering by T dot order by, we can do something like if order by is category, then let's do query order by C dot name and order direction and otherwise do the regular order by. Now let's log the SQL query that gets generated by this. So we'll do get query here and then get SQL. And let's go back to the browser. Uh, let's actually first delete the error log here. Let's go back to the browser. Let's refresh the page. Let's inspect this. And as you can see, we have the SQL here. Let's put this on their own line so we can understand what it is. 
and sure enough as you can see we have that left join here and it does the transactions dot category id equals categories dot id now to actually make the sorting available for the category we need to enable that within the data table here so let's remove the sortable restriction here let's save it make sure you're running npm run dev or npm run watch let's refresh the page we have the sorting now and as you can see the sorting works as expected we are sorting ascending if we sort descending that works as well and if we inspect the error log here let's see how it's sorted here we have left join and order by c1 name descending so it's working as expected so this is it for this video we'll be doing some more exercises later on so get excited about it thank you so much for watching hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so i'll see you in the next one